Hello and welcome y'all, it's your boy Sultan Skinny, Kaiser of all that's lean and politically unclean. Surrounded by the Aegean, Black, and Mediterranean seas, the Anatolian Peninsula has served as the dividing line between the Asian and European continents for thousands of years. Being at a maritime crossroad, the region has been of vital strategic importance for all European empires, as it controls a great deal of the continent's trade and trafficking. The economic and strategic significance of Anatolia's geography was fully realized in 330 CE, when the Roman Emperor Constantine moved the empire's capital from Rome to a small Greek settlement on the Bosphorus Strait known as Byzantium. Later renamed Constantinople, the city would serve as the new political and economic center of the Roman Empire after the sacking of Rome in 476 CE. While the western half of the empire fell into squabbling tribal kingdoms, the eastern half prospered as the new capital was well protected and closer to the areas that produced the majority of the empire's wealth. For several centuries, the eastern Byzantine Empire would continue Rome's legacy as a world power, having one of the largest militaries and economies of its day. Its influence on the world stage only grew as the empire's state religion of Christianity spread throughout the ancient world. Constantinople was the headquarters of the Eastern Orthodox Church, and the Hagia Sophia was the world's largest Christian church for nearly a millennium. To say that the Byzantine Empire left a lasting legacy on Europe's history, culture, and politics would be an understatement. Its preservation of Greek and Roman literature, innovation in law, and religious significance greatly impacted Europe's identity. Even after losing most of its territory to the Muslim invasions, the Byzantines remained one of Europe's most powerful and influential empires for centuries. The prestige of the Eastern Roman Empire in European politics and culture is undoubtedly the result of its capital city. The geographic positioning of Constantinople not only made the empire at the center of a trading crossroads, but being on a peninsula and having the pleasure of being behind massive stone walls also made the city difficult to capture. Even after the empire began to disintegrate into a collection of small islands and city-states, Constantinople continued to be among the largest and wealthiest cities in the world. Although in many ways the sick man of medieval Europe, the Byzantines and their city of Constantinople were an essential part of the continent's history and identity. But that would all change in 1453 when the Ottoman Sultan Mehmed the Conqueror captured the city of Constantinople. With a massive military armed with cannons weighing in at 15 tons, the modern Ottoman army laid waste to the city's ancient walls. The Sultan entered the city in marvel of its glory, preserving the Hagia Sophia and converting it into a mosque. The city would become the empire's new capital, and the Sultan would proclaim himself to be Kaiser i Rum, Caesar of Rome. So while the age of the Byzantines ended with the siege of Constantinople, the legacy of the Roman Empire continued with their Ottoman conquerors as they saw themselves as Rome's successors. And just as the Roman Empire forever shaped the history and identity of Europe, the Ottomans were destined to do the same.
When the Seljuk Turks arrived in Anatolia in the late 11th century, the Byzantine Empire lost a significant amount of its eastern territory. The peninsula's demographics changed rapidly as Muslim Turks replaced Christian Romans as the region's dominant population. Despite this, the Turks actually adopted many of the cultural and political practices of the Byzantine Romans. In fact, when the Turks of Anatolia declared independence from the larger Seljuk Empire, they called themselves the Sultanate of Rome. After the kingdom was conquered by the Mongolian Ilkhanate, the Sultanate disintegrated into smaller tribal nations called Beylik. One of these Beyliks were known as the Ottomans, a dynasty founded by Osman I, who legend says dreamed that his small kingdom would grow like a tree into a massive empire. Over time, through conquest and diplomacy, the Ottomans would absorb other Turkish Beyliks and the remaining territory of the Byzantine Empire. By the time Sultan Mehmed the Conqueror came to power in 1451, the empire surrounded Constantinople, holding most of Anatolia and the Balkans. Mehmed's siege of Constantinople is one of the most important events in European history, as it not only symbolically marked the death of the old Byzantine Romans and the birth of the new Ottoman Empire, but it is also suggested by many scholars to be the starting date of the European Renaissance. After the Ottomans captured the city, many Byzantine artisans and scholars fled to the city-states of the Italian peninsula, where they would bring many of the writings from ancient Greek and Roman sources. This reintroduction of Greco-Roman art, literature, and learning was the catalyst for inspiring the Renaissance, which would forever change how Europeans depicted the world, and most notably, themselves. After the siege of Constantinople, the Ottomans would declare themselves as the new Romans, continuing the latter's legacy of being the most powerful empire in Europe, and arguably, the world. At its greatest extent, the empire stretched its authority across all three continents, controlling traffic and shipping from the Black, Caspian, Mediterranean, and Red Seas. Like the Roman Empire before, the Ottomans were the dominant economic and military force of the Western Hemisphere. Even when surrounded by great empires like the Ethiopians, Habsburgs, and Safavids, the Ottomans would remain the top dog throughout the 16th, 17th, and even 18th centuries. Their success can be attributed to a lot of factors, but perhaps the most obvious one was their military. The Ottoman army was the first professional military Europe had seen since the Roman Empire. Known as the Janissaries, the Ottoman infantry was the most elite fighting force of their day, as their soldiers were not only very well trained, educated, and paid, but they were also all armed with guns, which was something that no other army had ever done before. As well as being the world's first modern standing army, the Ottomans were also the first to have military marching bands that would be used to intimidate enemy forces before engaging in battle. While being the first modern army is an impressive feat on its own, it is perhaps the marching bands that left the larger legacy in Europe's history. Turkish military bands set the standard for marching bands worldwide with their strong emphasis in using percussion drums and cymbals, instruments that were often lacking in early European orchestras. The rhythm that these bands would play is the same rhythm that modern military marches follow to this day. This simple rhythm and collection of different instruments would inspire a great deal of Enlightenment era music for centuries. Many of the great classical pieces composed by musicians such as Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven were inspired by Ottoman marching bands, to the point that the last two called some of their most famous pieces Marcia a la Turca. In fact, for most of the Renaissance and Enlightenment era, the Ottomans represented the epitome of European high society. Ottoman accessories were not only seen as exotic and otherworldly, but they were also a status of prestige in Western European circles. Ottoman carpets, dresses, decor, and even turbans were all imported and replicated to fuel the fashion trends of Western elites, especially those of France, who in 1536 established an alliance with the Ottoman Empire that would last for over two centuries. Along with ambassadors, the French kingdom sent artisans, poets, scholars, and writers 
to bring back works of Islamic art, literature, and science. The French were so fascinated by the Ottomans that many of the artistic representations of the empire's palaces and harems come from French artists who have never even visited the place. The importation of Islamic art, poems, and philosophy, along with tales from European travelers, inspired a great deal of European literature that would eventually evolve into what we now call Orientalism. This fascination with the exotic Muslim East would come in the form of both admiration and demonization, with writers like Jean-Jacques Rousseau praising the Prophet Muhammad's political leadership, and others like Voltaire portraying him as a religious fanatic. Regardless of these divisive portrayals, the Ottoman Empire remained to be a source of great inspiration for Enlightenment authors and artisans. One of the most important Western depictions of the Ottomans comes from the writings of a certain Lady Mary Montagu. While most Western accounts of the Ottomans usually came from the perspective of men, Lady Montagu's Turkish embassy letters challenged many of the notions previously asserted by writers before her. Having access to the women-only spaces and harems of the Ottomans, Montagu wrote in detail about the daily life and liberties women had in the empire. She described the harems and hammam bathhouses from a woman's perspective, as opposed to the hyper-sexualized fantasies of male writers who were never allowed inside. Her accounts of the harems, their women, clothing, and activities were some of the best of their time, and would inspire many of the Orientalist paintings and fashion trends that dominated the 18th and 19th centuries. She also wrote about how Ottoman women, and even slaves, had political and social freedoms that were not prevalent in her home of England. Montagu actually dedicates a lot of her letters to criticizing Catholic beliefs and customs, even suggesting that the religion of Islam and Oriental culture were a more reliable source of enlightenment. Lady Montagu's Turkish letters are considered to be among the most important works of the 18th century. On top of providing some of the best Western depictions of Ottoman life and paving the way for other female travelers and writers, Montagu was also the first person to introduce the practice of vaccination to Western Europe after having seen the Ottomans use it to combat smallpox. Despite her letters receiving condemnation from her mostly male peers, Montagu's obsession with Ottoman life and society was hardly the exception. The massive economy of the Ottomans allowed them to influence the luxurious goods Europeans would consume to such an extent that we still see its impact today. One of these products was the tulip. Prized for its vibrant colors, the tulip was a flower that dominated Ottoman gardens, palaces, and squares. Travelers from all over the world would visit the empire to marvel at its gardens and purchase their famous tulip buds. However, no nation had a taste for the tulip quite like the Dutch, who were by far the biggest consumers of the luxurious flower. The Dutch at one point had such a craving for this pretty plant that single tulip buds were worth more than the annual incomes of artisans. The ridiculous high pricing and demand for these flowers eventually led to what many consider to be the first recorded example of an economic bubble. Today, the tulip is famous for being the national flower of the Netherlands, which alone exports close to 50% of the world's flower bouquets, which mainly consist of tulips. As popular as tulips are, however, its consumption could never compete with what was by far the most addicting product the Ottomans introduced to Europe. Coffee. Originally coming from the Oromo peoples of Ethiopia, coffee quickly found its way throughout the Ottoman Empire as a popular beverage for mystics and intellectuals alike. The caffeine's effect was originally seen with superstition and condemnation, but the drink soon became a staple of Muslim society. The high produced from the caffeine was intoxicating but also productive. Artists, poets, scholars, and intellectuals would gather in coffee houses to converse about politics, religion, and gossip. The coffee house soon became the norm in Islamic cities and madrasas as the main go-to place for locals to socialize, play games, and study. Along with the drink itself, the culture surrounding coffee was introduced to the rest of Europe via the Ottoman Empire, with coffee houses quickly gaining popularity all over the continent. The beverage was quickly replacing alcohol as the drink of choice, which not only brought its own string of controversies and bans, but it also created a far more productive class of consumers. Like the Muslim world, coffee houses were where the European intelligentsia came to converse, debate, and study.
It also became the place where business elites would meet to make deals and purchases. In fact, the original location of the London Stock Exchange was a coffee house. The degree to which the culture surrounding coffee impacted the economic, social, and intellectual life of Western Europe is so ridiculous that some scholars would even argue that the beverage single-handedly fueled the European Enlightenment. Today, the coffee industry is an economic juggernaut, being the second most popular drink after tea and the second largest commodity in the world after crude oil, raking in hundreds of billions of dollars every year. And while the drink and its culture was originally a product of the Islamic world, it is the Western one that consumes it the most. Being the main supplier of goods to Western Europe not only made the Ottomans one of the largest economies in the world, but it also enriched the European continent itself. Despite most of its territory being in Africa and Asia, Europe was always the center of the empire. Its capital, Constantinia, was one of the largest cities in the world, as well as the main center for manufacturing and trade. Constantinia was such a popular place to go to that people began to just call the city Istanbul, which literally means to the city. The Ottomans would engage in trade with the rest of the Old World from Ethiopia, Mali, India to China, but its biggest customer was always Europe. For hundreds of years, European contact and trade with the rest of the world relied on the Ottomans. It was actually this dependency that forced Europeans to look west towards the Atlantic and around Africa, developing ships strong enough to withstand the long and often treacherous journeys. This would result in the discovery of the New World, which Europeans would then colonize and bring back their own vast array of goods and products. New cash crops like potatoes, tomatoes, and tobacco took the Old World by storm, completely changing the diets and consumer habits for billions of people. On top of that, the vast amount of land and slaves that the colonies had in their possession allowed for Europeans to outproduce crops they once imported from the Ottomans, like coffee, cotton, and sugar. This immense amount of raw material circulating into Western Europe fueled its industrialization, becoming the new center of manufacturing and trade. Being the free market society that it was, the Ottoman Empire eventually lost interest in developing its own industries because it was just cheaper to import Western products. As revenue declined and the West's influence grew, the Ottomans would start importing and consuming Western art, fashion, and even institutions. It was the armies of Britain, France, and Russia that now defined the modern military, slowly picking away Ottoman territory and becoming ever more influential in the lives and politics of the empire. Ottoman scholars and writers would travel to the West and bring back new ideas surrounding law, governance, and science. Westernization became synonymous with modernization, and as they declined in influence and prestige, the Ottomans kept trying to play catch-up by being more like the West. This process of the Ottomans becoming the sick man of Europe was a slow one that wouldn't have been noticed by its citizens. The empire's decline didn't come from a battle or a ruler, but rather from its own economic success. Being at the center of world trade and commerce made the Ottomans comfortable with where they were. Centuries of being comfortable eventually led to the Ottomans becoming trapped in their own geography by the navies of those they once surrounded. It was now Western Europe that influenced Ottoman markets, politics, and society. The Ottomans, along with the rest of the Islamic world, lost their place of global power and prestige to the Christian West, who would for the remainder of the millennia be the dominant hegemonic force of the globe. But while we mostly associate Europe's success to the western half of the continent, it was really the Ottomans that set up the stage for European exceptionalism. The West enjoys alienating the Ottomans as a foreign other, but it was by all means a European empire. Its capital and major financial districts were located on the continent. Its army, advisors, concubines, and elite consisted mostly of other Europeans. They standardized what it meant to be a modern European army. They were the first European colonial power, spreading the Turkish language and Islamic faith throughout its vast territory, most notably within Europe itself. In many ways, the Ottomans influenced Europe even more so than Africa and the Middle East, as an Islamic empire run by Turks was kind of normal at this point. 
But for Europe, its culture, demographics, and markets were forever changed. The Ottomans dictated how the West viewed the East, and in turn, themselves. Western civilization as a concept and identity was in large part sculpted by the fear and fascination of the Ottoman Empire. But of course, the impact and success of the Ottoman Empire wouldn't have been possible without its people. The diverse array of citizens from all creeds and ethnicities granted the Ottomans an opportunity to learn and cooperate with other people. The Turks were mainly in charge, but other groups like Berbers, Greeks, Jews, and Nubians all participated in the army, government, and markets of the empire. As impactful as all these people would be, there is one nation whose mark is worth highlighting. In order to govern such a diverse territory, the Ottomans needed to take a page out of some of the empires of its past. A lot of the social institutions adopted by the Ottomans came from the Byzantines before them. The religious community and law of Islam that the Ottomans championed came from the Arabs. But there was another group of people whose influence is often overlooked. It's a legacy that has impacted Islamic empires for centuries, but it's never really acknowledged all that much. You see, my friends, while the Ottoman lingua franca was Turkish and its legal and religious tongue Arabic, the educated class and high court officials would administer the empire in a language that governments have been using for thousands of years. Next episode, we inspect the impact and influence of the Iranian people in the age of Islamic dominance. We will learn about the various ways in which this nation not only preserved their culture and identity, but also how it shaped the Islamic world into what it is today. For you see, my friends, it is Iran's Islamification that ultimately led to Islam's Persianization. <laughs>